I don't love me, please. Today, I wanted to break down and compare two particularly fun scenes from recent media. In the left corner, we have torture scene one. Weighing in at about eight minutes, it is from 2022's Andor, the forgotten Disney Star Wars show that was actually the only good thing they've made in several years. And in the right corner, weighing in at five minutes, we have a torture scene from 2023's Secret Invasion, a show that might be doing well but has been showing no buzz on most of the online communities I am a part of. Is anyone gonna watch this video? Man, I'm sure someone will click on a thumbnail about torture, but first, What's going on? Unlike most media where I would spend some time setting up context, we both know what's up. Character A wants information from character B, and character B doesn't want to tell them. This means we get to indulge in depicting a taboo in order to move along the plot. We also get the opportunity to characterize both characters A and B, and even work on some world building if we felt so inclined. As a result, torture scenes in most media has the potential to be incredibly dense bits of the plot. And at the same time, because it's taboo, the audience will be extra focused, and we have incredible potential for emotional resonance when depicting someone in such pain. So, starting with Andor, we see a character we have known from episode one. She has been placed onto a chair, and we know she was fencing stolen Imperial equipment. Generally speaking, the audience should like her and desire her rescue at this point in the plot. The Imperial investigator, who had a name, I just forgot, begins a monologue. The monologue is a little rough, using what I would argue is a very awkward fishing metaphor. You pull in the net, and the easy thing, the quick thing, is to assume that everything you've dragged to shore is a fish. But the neat thing about it is we have spent some time with this interrogator before the scene. We know she is a very proud person and she is trying really hard to intimidate her foes. So when it comes off not quite effective, I think of the many speeches I have heard where the speaker used a metaphor more for the sake of having a metaphor than to make an effective point. For example, Life is like tea. The longer it seeps, the richer it gets. But then I take that and then I somehow force it into a speech that lasts an hour and feels very meaningful somehow, but also not meaningful at all. We are then introduced to a second character in the room with the assistance of a panning shot. This is a set up for very soon. I wish I had the proficiency to comment on the camera work here. I like it, but unfortunately all I really know is that I like the moving shots. It looks cool. We're then given the great tale of her interrogating another character which led to this person. This provides the context for how this scene came to be because it happened off camera and perhaps more importantly establishes that their methods are very effective at gathering information. This is important. Remember, while we like this character, it be out of character to snitch immediately and that would be a very disappointing scene while at the same time when the character snitches quickly we like them less because it's kind of a cowardly move we need to understand just how brutal it is if we really want to understand how the enemies got the information without harming the moral standing of the character you're in my net bigs are you a fish? In the metaphor again. Maybe I'm weird. This is either in character or the writer indulging in clever wordplay. And I want to believe it's the former, but on a now sit, it's, it's the weakest part of the scene. Moving on, Vic speaks. Your eyes be, aren't you? Worst of the worst. This is a moment of defiance, but more than that, it still reinforces the character. She does not want to give up the information. Remember, we do still need her to lose the interrogation, though. We just don't want the cowardly traits to be shown because that can harm us liking the character. The Imperial Chick then establishes her full list of demands. When refused, she abruptly exits as the music gets more intense. We then get an intervention to look at some of our other characters, even though this is the part we care about. All I have to say is you notice these more and more when you're breaking stuff down shot by shot. We cut back to our brave victim being bound and told the restraints are for her safety, implying the process will involve a lot of shaking and screaming. The doctor says early trials were a bit chaotic with an unendearing smile stitched to the end of that statement. He then begins with some exposition. The exposition is so that the tortured soul will know what she is about to suffer. I think it makes it a bit worse to know what's going on, and it helps with the intimidation factor of this group. See, on an unimportant moon, the Empire wanted to build a thing, but the natives said no. 
So the Empire did a genocide. When that occurred, some of the involved men were found in the fetal position after having gone through great mental anguish. You see, the species they killed makes a noise with a very powerful emotional resonance when they die. Much like a dog whimper, but on steroids. I mean, on steroids would just be a really manly dog whimper, but you get my point. And now, they have recordings of this super dog whimper. While the main aspect of this dialogue is establishing what brand of torture we will be looking at, we also have been given some more information about the Empire, recontextualizing some of the stuff in the show. One thing this show did really well is it established just how brutal and cruel the Empire was. The genocide isn't brought up as a big deal by anyone, it was just imperial policy, they were given any means necessary, they wiped out the population. But more than that, they had the audacity to kill someone, then record the dying gasps, and use it as a tool. We are then shown Vix getting a bit nervous as he pulls out a helmet, presumably it's just a speaker system that can be strapped to the head. The music kicks up as the helmet is placed, we get this moment worth gold, where we the audience know she cracked and the information is forfeit. I know you enjoyed that, but now we get an extra torture scene to break down and consider. In case you forgot from the intro, this one is from Secret Invasion, which I haven't been hating but wouldn't quite recommend. Once again, person A, person B, they want information and torture. We are introduced to, I'm not really sure, walking into a meat locker, where the man is currently being beaten by a set of goons. I'll be completely honest, I don't remember what led to this fellow's capture or who the present interrogators are. A phone call is made establishing the new individual is in charge and she takes over, kicking out all the goons to do the torture personally. We are told that the torture has already been going on for a while, meaning this man has already managed a decent amount of pain. The first line of the victim of the torture goes something like this. I'm gonna break these chains and then I'm gonna break every bone in your body. Now, I don't mean to be rude, but why would you say that? He can't break these chains. We are about to find out he is the MCU's shape-shifting scrolls, which means he is extremely strong. But if he could break the chains, win a fight, and leave, he would have done it by now. This isn't just a cocky statement, it's a little bit of a stupid one. This character has been established as stupid at the beginning of the scene where he's being tortured for information. Also, he looks like a bit like Poe Dameron from Star Wars. I forgot his name, and I was surprised to learn this was a different actor. Everyone say hi to Oriel Emil, who is a fine actor just in a not so great scene. We start by cutting off his finger, verifying the scroll nature. It's safe to assume she was already fairly certain of this, but it does establish her lack of issue with causing pain. Intermission for some other plot stuff, we're not worried about that. Then we are back and she has a needle. They exchange some generic dialogue before she says that he will talk when his blood boils at 163 degrees centigrade. Centigrade, it turns out, was the precursor to Celsius. Thank you, Google. So then I had to check, and that's about 325 degrees Fahrenheit. I will do no hawking when my blood is boiling at 325 degrees Fahrenheit. You see, that's because I am dead. Whenever your blood becomes a gas, it stops working as blood. You know, we're dead. But who knows, maybe it's like alien physiology or something. But there is a fresh hole in his hand so whenever it gets hot wouldn't his blood pressure go up and it would just spray out of his hand like a hose's nozzle i don't know i think that'd be funny we then get this somewhat clunky line of dialogue go ahead put it in my arm i don't care which is a setup for You lost me for the rest of the torture scene. This was the moment that killed it and kind of why I made this episode. The first time I watched this, I paused the show, burst out laughing, and the tone for the rest of the scene was promptly ruined. Torture is a very serious torment, but humans work off what they are shown. And this moment, we are told by the director, they are telling us, it's not serious. The scene goes on, I'll admit the acting is great, but the weight of the scene has been lost. So he starts talking and provides some exposition. It's not really important, but the information is new to us, the audience, which is a fun way to introduce it. I chose these two scenes because they have very similar production value, yet one is considerably more powerful than the other. The method of torture being one of the first elements to note in Andor. They took some time to foreshadow it, then introduced it with some very heavy exposition. The use of the tool was the very climax of the scene, and it hit pretty hard, but in Secret Evasion, it's the setup 
to a butt joke, and the tool is more or less forgotten after we just know it's brutal. Something regular torture could also have done, it's just a substitute, not really a meaningful individual thing. The interrogators and the victims were very similar in terms of acting and characterizations, no other scenes considered, but really the point that stands out between them is just that joke that they just mixed in. That moment in the scene, representing what should be the closest a human can get to hell in the waking world, is interrupted for a chuckle. It just it kills the entire thing. Thank you for your time. Please subscribe and enjoy your evening.